Was there one particular moment where I decided I gotta just like create and complete a blues archive? Not exactly one moment, but when I really figured out how rare some of these things were, and it started with one record. Okay, here's one record I found that no one else had ever found before. It was Blind Joe Reynolds on Paramount called Cold Woman Blues. And I knew right away it was a missing record. And I started to realize at that moment that, wait a minute, if I did this with one record, there's got to be more. There was a certain collector who, he said, oh, I'm divorced. It's kind of sad, but, you know, she came to me one day and she said, I'm going to leave you. I just don't want to do this anymore. And he says, well, just remember one thing. You will never, ever find another with as great a collection of records as I have. I'm John Tefteller, and I consider myself the Sherlock Holmes of record collecting. I travel all throughout the United States, town to town sometimes, in search of what I call the world's rarest records, which are mostly blues records from the 1920s and 30s, but I do buy and sell all types of records from the 20s, 30s, all the way up to the early 70s with rock and roll, rhythm and blues, surf music, girl groups, anything that is collectible from the 50s and 60s, as well as that early 1920s and 30s blues music. I love vintage music, always have since I was very young, so my original hobby of liking vintage music has turned into a business, which we call the world's rarest records. The earliest I could be there is some point early this fall. Is that okay, or do you have to do this sooner? Bob Dylan's John Wesley Harding LP from the late 60s, pretty common. Not so common like that. Back in the 50s and 60s, very few companies issued anything in colored vinyl. These are what we call pressing plant one-offs, where people who were working in the pressing plant when the records were popular and when they were being pressed at night, usually when they weren't supposed to, would go in and make funky, weird copies of records and trade them amongst themselves. One of those midnight pressing plant efforts and in beautiful orangey kind of gold vinyl. Rare Dylan records sometimes are $50,000, sometimes a little bit more, but this is a specialty item. There's only one. Does any rare Dylan collector have to have this? Maybe. Would they pay a huge amount of money for it? Most likely. Is it for sale? No. <laughs> it's going to be tight because I already got my plane tickets, but I do have one or two extra days. So at least during those two extra days, I could meet up with you. I could see what you have, buy some of it then or later or something. Sometimes when I go out on the road looking for things, and this is mostly years ago, I would look for a specific record, usually something on a small label from a small town, and then you go to that small town and you try to find the owner of that label in that small town. In this case, the record was a 1950s rockabilly record called I'm a Bebopping Daddy by a guy named Mac Banks. Bebop, I'm a Bebopping Daddy. Well, a Bebopping Daddy. 
which was on the Fame label out of Houston, Mississippi. Houston, Mississippi is a small town about two and a half hours south of Memphis in the middle of nowhere. So I go to Houston, Mississippi. Now I think, how am I going to find Mac Banks or how am I going to find the owner of the Fame label? Well, usually, if you can find the radio station, if there's a radio station in town that's been there that long, usually somebody there will know. So I found the radio station, which was a station called WCPC in Houston, Mississippi. I walked in and the girl behind the counter, the receptionist said, how can I help you? And I said, well, I'm trying to find a person that would know about a record by a fellow named Mac Banks on the Fame label. And she kind of smiled and she said, well, that's my father. He's not Mac Banks, but he owns the radio station here. And that song was cut here at the radio station. Uh, you need to talk to him. Okay, where is he? Well, he's out making sales calls and he'll be back shortly. So I sat down and I waited. And after about two hours of waiting, this older gentleman comes in and he goes and talks to the daughter. She tells him whatever she tells him and he comes back and he says, yes, I produced that record. Yes, it was produced here. Mac Banks is still alive. Uh, I can give you his phone number. Uh, what is your interest here? And I said, well, I'm trying to find copies of the record. And he says, well, I have some. I said, okay, do you have some extras that you'd be willing to sell? And he says, well, I don't really sell records. That's not my business. I guess I have an extra, I guess we could do that. I could sell you one. And I said, okay, do you have any other records that you could potentially sell? And he goes, well, we have lots of records here. He said, when I was in college with my brother back in the, in the 1940s, we collected records. We collected blues records from 20 years before. We collected jazz records, we collected country. He says, yes, we have lots and lots of records here. Okay, but are you willing to sell any? And he says, no. But he said, if you want to see him, he said, I'm happy to show him to you. So I said, okay, let's see him. So we go walking back into a hallway, down a, down a hallway. We come into this big wide room, which has nothing but records on shelves, floor to ceiling, as far as one can see. And he said, there they are. What do you want to look at? I said, well, let's look at blues. Do you have that in a particular section? He goes, yeah, it's over here. So we walk over to this section and there's this one cabinet that's about 10 feet high by eight feet long. And he says, there's the blues records, have a look. So I reached in and I pulled one out. Oh, got the boogie disease. Which was Dr. Ross on Sun, the boogie disease is the title of it. And I said, wow, this is great. And I said, you sure you don't want to sell this? He looked at me and he says, I'm not in the business of selling records, I'm in the business of playing them on the radio. And I said, you still play this? And he says, well, no, but if I wanted to, it's there. And I said, well, look, how about $1,000? And he looked at me like I was from Mars. And he said, $1,000 for one forty-five? And I said, yeah, you want it? I'm, I'm willing to do that, and I probably can do a whole lot more. <laughs> and he said, at $1,000? I said, well, no, they might be more, they might be less, but if you really would think about, he looked at me and he says, well, you know, people have come here for 30 years asking me to sell records out of this library, and I turned them all away. But he said, they were all interested in paying like a dollar or two dollars. You're telling me you'd pay me $1,000 for this 45? And I said, right now, if you want it. And he says, okay, he said, I tell you what, I don't have time to do this today, but if you wanna come back here in about three weeks, I will let you go through these records and anything that you want to pay me at least $100 for, you can buy. And I said, okay, I'll be back. And I went back three or four times and gave him a lot of money over that, that period of time. And that was probably the best single uh, collection of records I ever got into like that. Another rare Sun record, when Sun label was first going in the early to mid 50s, the first recordings on Sun were not by people like Elvis Presley and Roy Orbison and Johnny Cash and Jerry Lee Lewis. The first run of Sun records were either country or blues. And this particular one is a blues 45. The fellow's name is D.A. Hunt. If you listen to the record, he sounds quite a bit like Lightning Hopkins, who I think he was copying Lightning Hopkins' style. 
This was not known to exist on 45 until just a few short years ago. It was only believed to have been pressed on 78, but about five, 10 years ago, a copy turned up and I bought it on the internet for $10,000. It's not this copy. This, this copy is perfect. The one I bought was beat up. I do still have that one, but this is the perfect copy that turned up a few years ago after Hurricane Katrina. That's where this one came from. There are a total of three of these in existence now. I have the other one, which I had originally, which is beat up. This is the nice copy. And then another one turned up at the Austin Record Convention in Texas last year. And that was sold to a collector there because I didn't need it. I already had two of them. Value on this should be somewhere between thirty and fifty thousand dollars. Greyhound from Trotton, right back home. How many forty fives do you think you have? Oh, twenty thousand. How many seventy eights? Back in the 1920s up until about 1960, most records, especially the blues period of the 20s and 30s, those records were exclusively pressed on what's called shellac. And shellac is actually made from the shellac beetle. And what they used to do is they used to raise beetles by the millions in Indonesia and India, and they would then just grind them up, excrement and all, and that became the basis for shellac 78 RPM records. It's a brittle substance. It will break if you drop it. It will break if you pick it up and hold it the wrong way. It was ideal for the record companies because if you broke one, you'd go down and buy another one. The shellac records from the 1920s and 30s, and they, they made them up until about 1960. 5,078s, okay. And then there's some LPs. Well, I would have interest in those depending on what they are. I've always been interested in collecting the rarest of the rare blues records, which for the most part were on the Paramount label, which was originally headquartered in Grafton and Port Washington, Wisconsin. Other collectors have been going to Port Washington and Grafton for a while, trying to find Paramount records, and they weren't very successful. But I came up with an idea that I thought just might be successful, and it actually was. I created a mailer that I had professionally printed, and then I paid to have it sent to every household within 100 miles of Grafton and Port Washington, Wisconsin. And on the paper, it had pictures of Paramount Records, it had approximate values of what I would pay for the records, and it had a phone number, which was local, and I rented a hotel room in Port Washington, and I was sitting in the hotel ready for phone calls. And I had... <laughs> more phone calls in a two or three day space than I could ever dream of having. The phone just kept ringing and ringing and ringing from people who either had relatives that had worked at the pressing plant or had worked in the office where Paramount Records were distributed from, in some way had ties to Paramount Records. But locals and the people that worked at the plant didn't really care about blues records, so they didn't save those. They saved all the German marches and all the popular music of the day. So I spent a lot of time going through a lot of records that weren't very interesting, but I had access to all these collections in that area of people who worked at the company. And every once in a while, somebody by mistake or deliberate would have taken home a blues record, and they did. I found the only known copy of a record by a guy named King Solomon Hill, which had never been found before, and it's a great, great record. And everybody got to go. But it's too sad when you lose one of your best friends. Eh? You have to take it not just long. This is King Solomon Hill, My Buddy Blind Papa Lemon, which is talking about Blind Lemon Jefferson. And the other side of it is Times Is Done Got Hard, which is a great depression song. This record is in really beautiful condition. It, as I say, it came on the Wisconsin trip. If I had to sell it, I would price it at about $75,000. Most all shellac records are black. Now, they did have a way to create multicolored shellac records. And from my understanding, they used to mix in different colored wax with the shellac, and that would give the brightly colored hues and the different splatter effects on the shellac pressings. 
There was also original advertising material that had come from the Paramount Record Company, and a couple people kept file drawers filled with a lot of the original advertising material and photographs, including for the first time ever, the very first photo of Charlie Patton sitting in a chair holding his guitar and playing it. And that is probably outside of possibly the Robert Johnson photographs that exist, the single most important blues photograph ever. And it wasn't discovered till I went there in 2002 and did that mass mailing to the, the people of Port Washington and Grafton, Wisconsin. The earliest I could be there is this fall. Is that okay or do you have to do this sooner? You can see you pretty, you can hang it on the wall. The lot of one of kids is going on. When Patton was popular in the late 20s and early 30s, he, he was a little popular for a little while, but only among a certain segment of the African American population that really was into really what they would term down home gut bucket blues. And in the 60s, the white blues guys that liked all this stuff decided, well, that's what blues really should sound like, that, that unintelligible, down-in-the-dirt blues. And then I'm in Los Angeles, and then I'm in Pennsylvania. When I go to Pennsylvania, I'm coming south because I do have to come to Georgia, but that's not until the fall. Patton's not mainstream. It's not something most people can get into and listen. People were going, what am I hearing? What is this? I can't even make out what this guy's saying. And for years, there was no picture of him other than a headshot. And then when I found the shot where he's sitting in the chair holding the guitar, that became the iconic photo of Charlie Patton. And in fact, if you look how he's playing the car, he's got this like claw-like look to the guitar. That is a really unique style of guitar playing that originates in Africa that involves playing the guitar like that on your lap. A lot of the classic rock and roll of the 50s, 60s, and 70s was all pretty much inspired by the original blues performances in the 1920s and 30s. For example, you have Love in Vain, which the Rolling Stones did, is originally a Robert Johnson song. And I followed her to the station. There is a song called When the Levee Breaks, by Led Zeppelin, which is originally a song done by Memphis Minnie. Eric Clapton, Crossroads is based on Robert Johnson. Basically, the original blues music is the foundation of what is now modern day rock and roll. Unfortunately, it was born out of extreme poverty and a very prejudiced country. But in spite of all of that, the music that was created during that time does indeed provide the basis for everything that's come since. And uh, there's a phrase out there that says, the blues had a baby and they called it rock and roll. And that's, that's true. Here's another example of something that I don't necessarily collect, but I deal in. This is Bobby Fuller 4, I Fought the Law on Exeter. Now, if you bought Bobby Fuller's record, I Fought the Law, you didn't buy it on Exeter. You bought it on a different label. This is the original label before it was sold to the major label and became a big hit. And you can find millions of copies of this record on Mustang, but these records on Exeter are much harder to find. And value on this is about $500. All that blues revival stuff that happened in the 60s, it became, in a lot of ways, an exploitation. 
because they said they wrote Crossroads or they said they wrote When the Levee Breaks or whatever it is. They didn't. They didn't write those songs, yet they took credit for them. And meanwhile, Memphis Minnie, having had multiple strokes, is sitting dying in a nursing home in Memphis with not enough money to buy a Coke. So yeah, very bad situation. How you come up with a value for a particular record. And it's actually fairly simple. It's based on the condition of the record. Is it like new or is it scratched and scuffed? That's one way. And then you combine that with, is it something that is super rare? And is it something that there is a big demand for? Here's an example of what is considered by many to be the very first rock and roll record. This came out in 1950 one or so. It's Jackie Brinston and his Delta Cats. The song is called Rocket 88. It was covered by Bill Haley a little bit later. The original on chess usually is only seen on a 78. It was a fairly big hit. It was recorded at Sun Studios in Memphis and leased to chess. And it was the combination of having a broken amp that day and the fact that the amp gave off a particular unusual fuzzy sound when Ike Turner played the guitar that people have determined that the way this sounds, it sounds like the very beginnings of rock and roll. That's why they call it the first rock and roll 45. And it originally didn't come on 45. It was only a 78. The 78s do turn up quite frequently. Usually they're worn, but there are about five of these known to exist. And this is the best copy. It's virtually unplayed. Well, I would have interest in those depending on what they are. I'm gonna to try to work in at least a day, day and a half to see you when I come into Birmingham. If there's a big demand for it, it's super rare, and it's in really nice condition, that's a really great item. This is Alcohol and Jake Blues by Tommy Johnson. This record appeared on eBay about 10 years ago. The fellow that had it found it at an estate sale in South Carolina, had no idea what it was, stuck it on the internet with a $100 opening bid. Within 24 hours, the bid was up in the multiple thousands. It's Alcohol and Jake Blues. Tommy Johnson was, was very good. In fact, the original story of a singer supposedly selling his soul to the devil was not Robert Johnson. It was Tommy Johnson. And later on in the 70s, when they were trying to hype Robert Johnson, somebody transferred it over and said, oh, well, it wasn't Tommy Johnson that sold his soul to the devil. It was Robert Johnson that sold his soul to the devil. That's the myth and the legend, but this is the original Tommy Johnson. At the end of the auction, I won it for $37,100. This is the single most valuable 78 ever sold on eBay. It's going to be tight, but I do have my plane tickets, but I only have one or two extra days. How far is Stone Mountain, Georgia from Birmingham, Alabama? Because I have to go to Birmingham. I don't really have an emotional connection to this music. I don't think I'm entitled to have an emotional connection to these records. I didn't live the African-American experience in the 20s and 30s. I like the concept of being able to find and preserve that segment of American society, especially because of the prejudices that resulted in it being mostly destroyed and having to pick up all the little pieces and put it back together again in, a, in, a, in one single place to pass it down to the next amount of generations so that you can appreciate what they did in its best possible form. Probably the most famous blues singer of all time, Mr. Robert Johnson. And this is his most famous song, Crossroads Blues. Covered by 
innumerable amount of people since this originally came out. These are not easy to find. They do turn up once in a while, usually in destroyed condition. This one's in perfect condition, and value on this should be somewhere between seventy-five dollars and $100,000. For years, other collectors, older collectors, told me, well, there was this record, whatever it was. There was this record, but you'll never find it because nobody's ever found it. Well, I consider that a challenge. And that's where the Sherlock Holmes type thing comes in, because once I know there's something missing that hasn't been found, I make it a priority to find it. And in the last 30, 40 years, I've found at least a dozen or so records that have never, ever been found before. So I accepted the challenge that they couldn't be found. I found them, and now they exist, and now people can hear them. There are still records that have eluded me, and there probably still will be, until the day I died, but I still am convinced that they're out there. They're out there somewhere, in some barn, in some attic, in some garage, in some warehouse, in someone's house. They are out there somewhere, and the person that has them, or persons that has them, do not realize what they have. They don't understand that they're missing records. They don't understand that nobody else has a copy they don't get it. To them, it's just another record sitting in a cabinet or in a box or in the garage. And so it's my job to find those people who have things they don't realize are valuable and point out to them that they're valuable and scarce and buy them. Here is an original test pressing of a Robert Johnson record that was never released back in the 1930s. This is Robert Johnson doing phonograph blues, which you can hear on the reissues because it, it has been reissued. But this is the original Columbia test pressing that belonged to John Hammond and George Evakian. What they would do when the songs were recorded is make test pressings of everything that was recorded at the session. They would pass them around amongst the executives at Columbia Records. The executives would decide which ones got issued and which ones didn't. And then usually the test pressings were destroyed. In this case, this one survived. It is, I think, the only surviving copy. I consider it to be a priceless item of Robert Johnson. I have never ever seen an original Robert Johnson test pressing sold anywhere. I would be able to drive over there for at least a day and look at it, and then we'll be able to figure it out from there. And there are th at least two or three records now, it, it used to be more, that are really historically important because we know by who's playing on them that they will be great, and we know that they somehow just have to be found. Two of those are by a guy named Willie Brown. Lord, it seems like every minute sure gonna be my last. Willie Brown was a compatriot of Robert Johnson. Me and the devil for walking side by side. Sunhouse. Mm -hmm. Skip James. Willie Brown played on Charlie Patton records. Robert Johnson refers to him in the song Crossroads. I believe I'm sinking down. And he made three records for Paramount, one of which has been found, and I have it, and it's a great, great record. The other two records he made have never been found. We know the titles, we know the release numbers, we know that they were released, but no copies had ever been found. Here we have a Elvis original Mystery Train 45 on the Sun label. The first five Elvis records were recorded for Sun. Then his contract was sold to RCA and he became a huge, huge seller. The early Sun records did not sell near as well. They turn up 
fairly regularly because they did sell enough of them, but most of the time they turn up, they're in beat up condition with lots of scuffs and scratches on them. This particular example is pristine and unplayed. These normally sell for a few hundred dollars in used condition. This one should be several thousand because it's in pristine condition. The two missing Willie Brown records are probably the most significant of the records that are no longer available and are sitting in someone's garage somewhere. In an effort to try to bring them out, I have said on multiple occasions over the last 10 or so years that I would be willing to pay quite a sum of money to anyone who can come up with either of those two records in any kind of playable condition. I started out with $25,000 a record about 10 years ago, and I'm up to now 50,000, 75,000, whatever, just find them, just find them. It's Willie Brown on Paramount, 13096, kicking in my sleep blues, backed with window blues. And Paramount 13001, Grandma Blues. There are other records by J.D. Short. There's a J.D. Short on Paramount that's missing. There is a Roosevelt Sykes on Paramount that's missing. There's a Big Bill Brunzi on Paramount that's missing. Those would probably be the most significant. What I like to do is find those original records in the best possible quality, restore them in the best possible quality, and make them available in the best possible quality because that lets the artist shine. So you can appreciate the person who made it, appreciate what they were going through when they made it, and give them their due in history. I spend a lot of time searching for records. I will be on the road about two weeks out of the month. I could be in Birmingham, Alabama. I could be in Texas. I could be in Florida. I could be in Chicago. I could be in Detroit. I check in with fellow dealers, fellow collectors, pickers, people who've got stuff in the last few months. And I make the rounds and I see what they have and I buy what I need either for my business or every once in a while, something for my personal collection. In September, there's Allentown, Pennsylvania, where they have a, a pretty large size record show there. October is also uh, Austin Record Convention in, in Austin, Texas. So I'm all over the place. And, and when I go to those shows, I go to the shows and I buy things, yes. R&B Vocal Group, Jackson Trio, and the Evaneers in Hollywood. But I also use that opportunity to be in that area to go see people within a two, three, 400 mile radius of that particular location and pick up things that way too. 20,045, 5,078 in Stone Mountain, Georgia. Could be something, could be nothing, I don't know. As I went along, I started realizing that what I was actually doing was putting together a pretty much complete archive of American blues music from the 1920s up into the early 60s, with an emphasis on the 20s and 30s stuff, which is the most rare, most valuable, most collectible. So that would be better than anything any museum could come up with, better than anything any archive would come up with. That's kind of now the end game. I'm still missing a few pieces here and there, but I'm awfully close and I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. But the biggest issue is I don't know if there is any archive or museum or philanthropist or anybody out there that would appreciate it enough to want to take it on as a whole and preserve it into the future. I don't know if that's going to happen. That would be what I would like to happen, but I don't know if that's what's going to happen. So we'll just have to wait and see. In the meantime, I'm going to continue to fill in the few remaining holes that I have left in the collection, continue to look for the very rarest records that haven't shown up yet, and just keep polishing the diamonds, so to speak, until I can't do it anymore, and then someone else will have to make the decision as to what to do. Thank you.